today and you know Jesus Christ, I hope you don't fear death. Because if you do, you're fearing the very thing that you will never experience. It's like the little girl who kept crossing the cemetery on her way home. They said, aren't you bothered to cross the cemetery on your way home? She said, no. Why does it bother you to cross the cemetery? She said, because it's the shortest way to get to my house. Death is only the short way to get to where God is. And it is the very thing you will never experience because as soon as you die, less than the time it takes to know you're dead, you will know you're not dead because you will be in the presence of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So, so you won't even have time to know you're dead. Okay? So this is Tony Evans with his great uh, sermon, of course, the opening. I decided to introduce myself and share with you the story about the end times from my own recollection of what I remember of being on the other side, uh, including the, uh, all the chronological events preceding World War III, which will start in the year 2024. So uh, let me uh, continue Tony Evans in the background and introduce myself and uh, start telling you about the re-election of Donald Trump for the second term in the year 2024, as it will happen from everything that I have witnessed by being on the other side. Absolutely critical that we come to understand what Jesus Christ has done. He has so the it was the quite a... Uh, uh, serious commitment uh, on my part I just uh, went out and um, to Circuit City and bought the Sony camcorder to record this message for posterity and to share it with all the believers who will be listening to this message in hopes of uh, having some kind of hope and a plan of action my name is Sam and I've actually been to the other side uninvited if you will it just happened. I didn't seek it. It happened. And I'd like to share this story with you so that you have a chronological order of all events that will um, actually take place. Today is March the 4th of the year 2000. And I decided to share with you what will happen next year in September of 2001 in New York City and that will start a war in the Middle East in 2003 as a result of this um, military operation and so on and so forth. I will share with you all the events leading up to this, uh, the end of time, the apocalyptic World War III, which will include involved nuclear weapons in the year 2027. So, Everything <clears throat> that we go through in life on the other side has already happened. And essentially, uh, time does not exist on the other side. And all the events that took place are happening now and that will take place in the future are all kind of bundled into one category as uh, non-timed events. And I'd like to share them with you because I have witnessed them on the other side. By the way, the language on the other side is not a human language. The language that is spoken by God, if you will, or the foundation of everything that takes it's place is not, not physical, physical laws, laws or a human language, but rather mathematics or higher mathematics upon which all the um, uh, universe was built. All the galaxies are kind of formulated and they're rotating in the spiral formation. Water kind of whirls around in a spiral rotational shape. Our DNA helix is actually located in a very similar fashion and so on and so forth. Our even own, our own hair grows on the back of our heads in a similar spiral fashion. So everything resembles this God's design, which is God does not speak Hebrew, folks. I wanted to share that with you. He does not speak Aramaic or he does not speak Arabic. He speaks mathematics, higher mathematics, which is what I just described to you, the world upon which everything is built, which can only be described as higher mathematics. Many years ago, I was with my parents. Um, I was 
five years old and we were driving in the mountains. We stopped for just a few minutes. It was uh, a quick pit stop. And as we uh, got out of the car, as we all got out of the car, myself included, as I put my foot on the ground, I realized that suddenly I was not present on earth. It was a different um, dimension, if you will, a different world. And as I found out later on, after I returned back to my parents, I disappeared from my parents' view. And similar what Jacob witnessed in the Old Testament, the, the proverbial Jacob's ladder that he saw, kind of, sort of, not exactly, but something that if I were to put it in a human language, human format, this is a transport system that I witnessed that I was traveling on, perhaps because I was uh, an innocent child, an innocent uh, little boy at the age of five, you know, there's nothing but innocence and purity. I was allowed to enter God's domain. Perhaps I just stepped into it. I don't know why, but what I could tell you is that I started asking questions in that other language, non-human language, in that sort of a multi-dimensional mathematical language that perhaps it's not possible for human beings to even begin to comprehend or to describe. We live in a three-dimensional world here on this planet, but on the other side, there are hundreds and hundreds of dimensions that exist at the same time, which the human brain simply cannot process or cannot handle. So this would be the best attempt at describing what I've witnessed. That's why I decided to buy this camcorder to record this and to, if you will, advertise it on the local TV channels and perhaps even national syndicated radio TV channels to broadcast this message because I'd like to find like-minded people, believers who'd like to band together for the sake of surviving this apocalyptic event because of this information that I was given just like in the days of Noah. Uh, when Noah was building his ark, everybody was laughing at him. But despite the ridicule that he received from his local villagers, I guess, or his local people around him, his family was saved, and including Noah, of course, himself. And similarly, I believe I would be essentially in the same capacity, kind of organizing a, um, a movement for people who want to be saved in the last days to survive all the events that will soon take place. As I mentioned, next year, September of 2001 will be a very, the very beginning, the era of destruction of what I've learned on the other side. By the way, I was asking questions on the other side in the form of, was almost like a question-answer session, if you will, rapid question-answer succession. Essentially, because there was no time, the best way to compare it would be, I was asking a billion questions Per second and I was receiving a billion answers every second. But because time does not exist on the other side in that multi-dimensional realm, using a scientific language, it appeared to be like a continuous communication. The bliss, if you will, using the biblical language that Tony Evans would perhaps use. Jesus used an ancient Aramaic language because he was typically around fishermen who had a very limited vocabulary of approximately 250 words. That's the total vocabulary that most people had at the time. In the Galilee, of course, that was the most backward place on the face of the earth at that time. So you would be lucky if people knew 200 words was primarily uh, they were concerned about how to eat, procreate, and uh, essentially earn a living and pay taxes. That's it. You might say it's quite similar to today. Yes, it is. It bears resemblance to what we go through today. However, it was much, much more brutal and basic and primitive time compared to today. I would say we still live in a lap of luxury compared to 2,000 years ago in Galilee. And so Jesus was forced to use this basic language. If he appeared today, I believe he would use the very same language that I would use with you today. It's a language that would resemble more kind of a scientific approach, scientific explanation describing the galaxies because we now are aware of the galaxies that were located in the fourth arm of the what we call a Milky Way galaxy that rotates. We actually travel at a very fast speed. We travel at 600,000 kilometers per hour around the axis of our galaxy, or 650,000 kilometers or 600,000 miles per hour around the axis. And so everything is in motion, very, very rapid motion. We're actually expanding. 
and I'm going to talk about the supernovas or the super bright stars and that will be seen in uh, 20 years as you just would look up in the sky if you'll be still around at that time it will be uh, the signs of what St. John recorded on the island of Patmos when he was exiled there in his book of Revelation. And so what I'd like to go through now is chronologically share with you when I return to my parents, I would like to share with you all the events that will take place and what we can do as believers to prepare ourselves. As I returned to my parents, approximately a few hours later, Earth time, which to me there was no delay, it was, it was just a, an instantaneous trip to the other side and then re-entry back to Earth or earthly realm where my parents were. My mother was hysterical she, um, because I disappeared from their view. They were trying to find me and my father was trying to comfort her by saying I probably was hiding under the car, which was not possible uh, physically or just they searched for me everywhere. Everywhere. I just simply disappeared from their sight. As I mentioned, I was taken up on this transport, not a channel, but almost like Jacob's ladder into paradise. And that transport represents a very sophisticated piece of machinery that's built out of non-metallic or non-physical, non-earthly type of material. and something so sophisticated that I would have to say, again, using scientific language, if we just essentially a hundred years ago got off the horse and started driving cars, even though primitive cars, you know, internal combustion engines today, imagine uh, what we would have, what type of technology we would have in a hundred years or 500 years. Right now we just tested the very first SMS text messages. My wife, I bought her a Nokia 5160 digital phone and I'm still using analog phone, AudioVox 480, that has that SMS feature built into the capability of the phone. So even though it's an analog phone, we were able to test it and it, it worked. It's um, on my end, it's very primitive. On her end, the Nokia 5160 displays it much better. So we're just now entering this new technology that keeps changing every, every almost six months. Imagine what we will have in a hundred years. So this transport unit, I would like to say, was built by a civilization that is billions upon billions upon billions of years ahead of our time. So it's unimaginable level of advanced technology that sort of crosses over from having physical objects or even biological bodies like ours, that we have flesh and bone, flesh and blood, their bodies on the other side, they are spiritual bodies because they have evolved to that level of advancement and sophistication. And all of their, if you will, transport units do not involve any kind of what we call on Earth propulsion, like jet engine propulsion. That would be extremely barbaric or primitive. We cannot even compare their level of technology to ours. So now imagine if, like I said, we just started having cell phones just a few years ago. Prior to that, we did not. We had to go use a payphone to make a phone call or go into somebody's office or home to ask them for permission to use the phone if you were running late. Now we could just, my wife and I, we just tested this text message capability last week. If So if you're running late, you could send somebody a text message saying, I'm running late. It's a, it's a new technology that we use now. And we just started just a few years ago. Now imagine what kind of technology could be developed in 500 years or a million years or a billion years. Now you have an idea of what we're dealing with here. So it's an extremely advanced civilization that cannot be understood or described by our primitive understanding of the world with the laws of physics that do not exist on the other side. The human mind is so limited and primitive as far as even beginning to approach to analyze it. It simply gives up at some point. This is why in the Old Testament it is written when the angels were using that, again, primitive Aramaic language, that barbaric language that they were flying through the sky or in heaven and they were crying out, holy, holy, holy. Let me explain what that means using my new perspective. That means that God, who is a super creative spirit, the source of all life, the source of all light, is, is, could be perhaps described as the uncreated light 
the source of all energy that is so bright, so pure, so perfect that even the mind or the comprehension of the angelic force, the super creatures that witnessed all of the creation, cannot, they even give up essentially and the only thing they could utter, if you will, if there is such a, an expression, if they could say anything that would be awe. Using the Shakespearean language, of course, you know, William Shakespeare, I'm using him as a standard for describing English words, and the word awesome is the word that uh, should be reserved strictly for describing the most heartbreaking, striking beauty and power that exists in nature, such as the awesome nature of God, not for describing anything else. So these awestruck beings, the angels, they're awestruck in such a way that they can't say anything other than holy, 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 meaning using our contemporary scientific language, we would simply not have any words to describe the grandeur and the beauty of God and His perfection and His power and His might. We cannot even survive being in His presence. This is what I wanted to talk to you about. The only way we can approach God using a scientific language today from my trip to the other side, I could tell you from my own experience, is to be on His frequency using scientific modern language. In the old days, they used to call it um, being pious or religious or righteous, and it, it is rightly so. You could describe it as being righteous and doing nothing but good, meaning by being on the proper elevated frequency. So instead of listening to rap music, which is lower frequency, you should be listening to someone like Antonio Vivaldi. For instance, if you like the Four Seasons, uh, you would notice the transition between spring and summer, the most, I believe, most beautiful transition. Now, if you've never listened to the Four Seasons by Antonio Vivaldi, I highly encourage you to do that. And even if you like rap music, I assure you, if your heart is open to the things of beauty, you will immediately switch to listening to Antonio Vivaldi. You'll never, ever, ever touch the uh, that other any other style of music because it's simply not music it's of the demonic realm it's a primitive realm it's not going to get you very far in life and uh, in fact it will bog you down in uh, an emotional roller coaster or it will attract nothing but negative events and people and path in life so let me just kind of continue with my story since again the whole purpose of me sharing with you is uh, I've been debating for a very long time whether or not to share the story and I finally decided what do I have to lose you know, life is short and every moment is very, very precious. I'd like to document my trip to the other side to give hope and direction to all the believers, to unite them in this one, perhaps even God willing, global movement of uh, righteousness, of purity, of elevated spirit. And by the way, Tony Evans represents the biblical, obviously, teaching. And uh, those of you who are followers of the Quran or the Book of the Dead, if you're a Buddhist, it's really, you have to understand, the Bible, the Quran, or the Book of the Dead represents 0.000001% of the totality of the information that I saw on the other side. In other words, it's really just not even half a breath of that would describe all that information. Half of it actually was not quite properly represented that I'm the judge of that because I've been to the other side. I've seen God, if you will, face to face. And I'm here to share with you what it is like on the other side. The fact that you could see from the other side all of the events that are taking place in that multidimensional, beautifully interwoven fabric of events that have billions and billions and billions of possibilities depending on the spiritual state of the human being here on earth. That's right, we can affect certain events, certain events through our intention, if you will, call it faith. But I would say if you were to change something about your life, yes, you can even though it's pre, almost pre, it is predetermined, but through the fortitude, through the fortitude of your spirit, your desire to change something for the better. I'm not saying you should be praying for some catastrophic event to happen, but I'm asking you if you would like to pray for peace, you will see peace in your life. You will see peace for whomever you wish it upon. And that's the whole purpose of me sharing with you the beauty of my messages. The other side, the proverbial paradise or heaven, is such a beautiful place. Again, we only could compare it to understanding God by being on His frequency. 
and his frequency is not our frequency here on earth where so if you will if i were to compare god's being on in heaven and us trying to understand him here on earth i would say we need to pull our heads from the gutter because this is where we are using that analogy where proverbially speaking we keep our heads in the gutter in this sort of a lower mentality lower frequency rap music or just lower vibrational kind of a events and anger and being upset with nothing I mean nothing meaning unimportant things that are inconsequential in the grand scheme of things and so I highly highly recommend that you go on a 7 day meditative state like a if you will spiritual retreat where you would be fasting not eating anything for 7 days and just listening to Gregorian chants as I mentioned God speaks mathematics and so music is purely mathematical if you have any musical education you would obviously understand what I'm saying M- music is based on purely purely mathematic it's a mathematic form of uh, mathematical language music is So Gregorian chants is the only music that I could relate that somehow those monks who are chanting in a very specific way they're hitting those notes exactly precisely in the most harmonic way that resembles that precision precise communication of God's mathematical harmony So I wouldn't recommend anything other than Gregorian chants if you happen to like them they will help you focus no news no TV just you and your glass of water in the morning with some lemon and just reading the bible or the book of the dead whatever you like to meditate on you don't even have to have anything but it it helps to have some kind of a spiritual material while you're meditating in the morning before the sun comes up preferably for 7 days straight and within 7 days you realize that 95% of all the thoughts and everything you think you represent are not they're not your thoughts they've been implanted there by society by your parents by your friends by the media by everything that surrounds you that you've been while you were growing up from the time you were born until you became conscious of your existence here on this planet and so I highly recommend that you do that that's a very important step in your spiritual evolution and so moving on so when I returned from the other side my mother was as I mentioned hysterical she asked me where I was hiding I told her I didn't understand what she was uh asking me I wasn't hiding anywhere and so I was probably it was an enormous privilege for me to be able to retain all that information because as we fall asleep you might be wondering if you've never wondered what is sleep what is the purpose of us falling asleep every uh, for all mammals on this planet including you know animals and plants what's the purpose of sleeping at night is it for our physical bodies to be rejuvenated i'm going to give you an answer that i received on that i saw vividly on the other side it's actually not giving rest to your physical body is just a side effect of actually connecting the god's frequency while your spirit leaves partially your body goes to the other side partially this is why some of the dreams are not very vivid or lucid and you cannot move typically you cannot really bring the um anything about on the other side and transition it in the materialize it in this physical world but i have to assure you that that world is the threshold to the real paradise in fact if you think about it we sleep a third of our lives and sometimes one should question you know are we really alive here while we're awake or are we more awake while we're sleeping and we only dream about us being awake because it's a really it's a dichotomy it's a strange kind of a comparison if you think about it And so as I returned I told my mother that I didn't go anywhere and she was really distraught really I've never seen her like that in my life my father was really distraught but he didn't want to uh, uh really show that he was um, also very concerned he thought maybe I went over the ledge you know if we were in the mountains and maybe I just somehow jumped over the ledge and just uh disappeared there but you know again I just we all were getting out of the car and then I disappeared and that's where I entered I stepped into that realm that perhaps um, Jacob witnessed and very few people uh it's a unique event that you step into that multidimensional portal or using modern scientific language a gateway that takes you to the other dimension where you see the inner mechanisms of this universe how our physical reality is being affected by the spirit world 
and there are pleasant or kind spirits and there are evil spirits so you have to be aware that when the bible says there are demons who wish you harm indeed there are some very very not so pleasant uh, entities on the other side that you need to be aware of so when you pray to god for protection that is actually a very practical thing to do you will receive what the bible calls guardian angels who will guard you and keep you safe on your journeys and uh, you should pray for peace and safety of your loved ones and your, your own safety and peace. I highly recommend that. So now as far as all the chronological events, let me go through them very briefly and then I'm going to dive into them in more so we can an analyze them in more detail what how they would appear on your TV screens and the news and other sources of media and uh, what they actually are in real life. So, as I mentioned, next year in September of 2001, the tallest two buildings in New York City will be dismantled. They will be actually evaporated, pulverized into dust. And it would be presented in the media as if a group of uh, young students of Islamic faith would do such a thing. Where in actuality, it's a, it's a military operation, it's a false flag operation that would blame them so that another country would pay dearly for that act of demolishing these two buildings in September of 2001. So many personal freedoms will be um, removed immediately after September 2001. There are a lot of people involved in that particular event. Uh, military people, politicians, business people, real estate developers in New York City who will be profiting to the tune of billions of dollars for simply just participating, including insurance fraud, because those two buildings will be insured for $6 billion. And then when the insurance company uh, would refuse to pay because they would simply say, this is impossible. You know, you came to us to insure those buildings just a few weeks prior to it happening. It's almost like you, were, you knew it was gonna happen. So long story short, I'd like to tell you that many, many people who are involved in, in that event in one way or another will be benefiting from this unusual criminal activity so by removing the buildings in 2003 a war would be started that will bring a lot of economic activity as you know in a capitalistic system a war machine by firing those missiles and bringing those tanks into action somebody profits from that greatly and so the banking sector the military industrial sector would uh, benefit to the tune of two trillion dollars as a result of that uh, eight-year war that will be fought in iraq so Iraq will be dismantled and will be rebuilt and that process of dismantling and rebuilding will cause positive economic benefit to all the contractors, all the massive multinational corporations, companies that will be involved in rebuilding the infrastructure in Iraq. And then, of course, in 2007, 8, and 9, there will be a new similar event. There will be a financial crisis that will actually span the globe. It will start in the United States, which will involve, again, a very similar approach. A group of uh, New York City investment bankers would devise certain securities which simply do not exist. They would devise financial instruments that could be traded to make a very complicated long story short, uh, a made up instrument that will be traded that will is not backed by anything, will bring down the financial system that will be bailed out by the government or by the taxpayers. So it will be a essentially a global financial crisis that was again pre-planned, caused by a very small group of people that uh, intentionally caused the collapse of the financial markets. They knew what they were doing. Millions of Americans will lose their homes, and around the world there will be great suffering. The following year, well, in the year 2009, the first Negro president will be elected in the United States. That's right. Colored uh, presidents were not known up until the year 2009 A.D., and it will be also later discovered that he would be married to first transvestite person. So the wife supposedly that they have two children with uh, was actually a man that posed as a woman but as a transvestite couple so the first couple that will be uh, you know essentially outed by Joan Rivers would be this couple in the White House 
And by the way, Joan Rivers was going to do that, but she was actually stopped. So as soon as she recorded this uh, shocking expose, what was meant to go on air and talk about this very issue, she was found dead. She suddenly had uh, some health problems and was artificially induced coma at the hospital. She died and then all the tapes disappeared. But she was actually preparing that particular episode to share with the world. But the first couple that had kind of a different orientation, which, by the way, will become commonplace in, uh, in the United States, along with mass shootings that will, um, as you know, we just had uh, Columbine High School mass shooting in Colorado in uh, 1999. Well, what will be um, very commonplace in the future would be quite similar to the Columbine shooting. It will be almost like a, a weekly occurrence, literally almost a weekly occurrence. For instance, in 2007, there will be a, a Virginia Polytechnic Institute shooting where 32 people will be dead. In 2012, there will be a shooting in Sandy Hook Elementary School where 27 people would, would lose their lives. And in 2016, there'll be a shooting in Orlando, Florida at a nightclub where 49 people would lose their lives. 2017, there will be a, a shooting in Las Vegas at a country music festival where 60 people would lose their lives. And 2019, there will be a shooting in El Paso, Texas at Walmart where 23 people would lose their lives and so on and so forth. In 2021 in Boulder, Colorado, there will be a shooting almost, like I said, on a weekly basis where by the year 2025, all personal guns and weapons will be confiscated by the government in the United States of America. That's right. It would be a very uh, civil war-like situation because of how gradually the population would be sort of led up to giving up their weapons and some people, a small fraction, would not give them up. And this would cause the uh, civil war-like situation. So interestingly, I mentioned the year 2021, the mass shooting in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Well, in 2020, there was a new type of biological warfare that started, that was fought between a coalition of certain Asian countries against the coalition of other Western countries, such as United States and Western European countries. And uh, this biological warfare in 20 years, in 2020, which will be full-blown, will be presented in such a way that it's very hard, it will be presented as actually a runaway a virus, a biological virus that was created in 1942 by the British military scientists. They essentially created the first biological virus to be used against the German troops during the World War II action. So, so they took this small, in 1942, they took this small bomb and detonated it two kilometers off the coast of Scotland on a desolate island. And they brought some animals, to, obviously, to, be, to test this you know, biological weapon on. And 80 sheep instantly lost their lives when they returned to check up on the animals the following day. One of the sheep went missing, and they couldn't find it, and they were very concerned. They finally said maybe it got washed off the island when it decided to get some water. But actually, as the uh, story goes, in 1942, that one sheep got washed on shore in Scotland, and many, many farmers and farm animals got infected with this biological military-grade virus and died. And then this very virus in 1942 very rapidly spread into Western Europe, continental Europe, and then into Central Europe, Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, Siberia, Japan, so a great number of people died in 1942 as a result of this military-grade virus. And so in 2020, this is a much more sophisticated version, modified version of the same virus, similar virus that was designed to actually, remember, on TV, it will be presented as a naturally occurring virus that uh, will be used as a, as a ruse to keep people under more control, strict control, to essentially imprisoned in their homes and uh, they would have to go through all kinds of measures to supposedly keep the virus from spreading. But in actuality, this is just a prelude, just a, a ruse to have 100% uh, totalitarian control over the population around the globe because it will go global, just like the financial crisis went global. So so this biological warfare became, or this virus went global. 
And the most interesting part, this virus in 2020 will be designed to remain dormant in the body. It will not kill a large portion of the population except for those who are elderly and who have lung conditions or people who have a weakened immune system perhaps that would probably not be able to handle that particular modified virus. But the majority of the population will survive and would not be affected up until a certain point in time a few years later when this virus will be activated by certain low frequency microwave radiation that will be essentially turned on by pointing those microwave antennas from satellites at certain population zones for example let's say if the world elite or the ruling class of america decides to reduce the population which is the ultimate goal of course to bring it down a little bit from seven and a half billion as it will be in the year 2020 to let's say three billion well they can selectively choose certain countries let's say tunisia or morocco point their microwave antennas from the satellites from space activate that frequency that dormant virus that's present in those people living in those countries will activate and that uh, obviously uh, the uh, symptomatology will take effect and they will succumb to whatever disease that's been pre-programmed to be activated by this certain radiation or the certain microwave radiation essentially so that's the, the weapon in a nutshell. It's a new biological form of weapon where all the infrastructure will remain intact. So the buildings will no longer have to be destroyed like they destroyed the uh, infrastructure in 1945 in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So no need to use the nuclear weapons. However, they will be used during the 2027 World War III. Now I'm going to tell you in just a little bit what will take place in 2027 and why the nuclear weapons will be used instead of biological. It's a slightly different, unpredictable, highly unpredictable chain of events according to the global elite and the ruling class at that time. There's something that they have not really planned for or will not even be prepared for, but I'm going to share that with you. Uh, so moving on, so the, the, the year 2020, that's the uh, new type of biological warfare that will be fought. And the, uh, that's a perfect way of introducing the biblical mark of the beast to people, how they would have to get certain passports, digital passports, so they would not be able to travel anywhere or buy or sell anything, which is directly from the pages of the book of Revelation that St. John wrote about while on the island of Patmos, which is today a Greek island, but at the time while he was there, he was in exile, similar to Australia for the British Empire, where they would exile all of their prisoners to. So the island of Patmos was part of Roman Empire's prison island where they would uh, exile political prisoners and, and the like. So on the island of Patmos, he wrote, I believe in chapter 17, he wrote that uh, here is wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for his, this number is the number of a man, and this number is the number of 666. Now, so what does it mean, you might ask? What does it mean? Well, let me tell you from that eternal perspective that I'm very privileged to have. So during the 2020 biological fake biological warfare. It's actually the war was real. It was just presented as something else. That's why I'm saying it's fake in terms of how it's presented on your TV screens. So it will be presented as a naturally occurring event uh, virus. While it, I just told you it was created in 1942 by the British military and ever since that point in time it's been heavily heavily modified every five years or so. So it's been essentially modified beyond recognition. And so when this event will take place in 2020, it would be a perfect segue to introduce the Mark of the Beast, where you would not be able to travel or buy or sell anything without, or be accepted in society or be even be in society, be walking down the street without this digital passport that will signify that you've essentially been, you've accepted the mark. Well, what is the mark, you might ask? What is this mark? Well, essentially, it's nothing but a digital form of acknowledgement that you have been vaccinated for this. They will call it a virus, but it's, in actuality, it's just a, um, it's something else. So, very interesting, in um, the same year, 
later that year in 2020, a very interesting event will take place. As I mentioned, the war in Iraq lasted for eight years, but there will be another war that will be fought that is no less important, and yet very few people would even hear about it in the media, in the news, on TV and radio. You see, Mount Ararat is currently located where Noah's Ark landed. Currently located, it's technically Turkish territory because it was given up by Armenia, where it used to belong to, in 1921 at a Kars Treaty, where they had to trade territories to pacify the local conflict zone because of the Kurdish rebels and guerrilla fighters. There were a lot of casualties and problems, military action at that time in the 1920s on the border of Armenia, Turkey, and Iran. And so to pacify, well, at that time, Armenia became part of the USSR. So to pacify all the parties, the Soviet Union gave up Mount Ararat to Turkey. And this is where Noah's Ark uh, landed, and to this day it's at 4,012 meter elevation on the eastern slope. It's located on the eastern slope, not on the western slope, where all the tourists are usually led to, to believe that's where it's at. But the Kurdish villagers who live there, they deliberately, intentionally mislead the tourists and they lead them to some other part of the mountain and tell them it's somewhere up there. Just take your photos and be gone. So the reason why I bring this up is because there will be a war in that region. And this is the proverbial the War of Armageddon that will take place in 2027. So in 2020, there will be a very short war in the region of Nagorno-Karabakh. And Nagorno-Karabakh is part of Armenia on the border of Armenia and Azerbaijan that they're having some issues with. It's a similar story like the never-ending conflict between the Arabs and the Israelis in the uh, Gaza Strip. And so, so Nagorno-Karabakh is the Gaza Strip of the Caucasus, you know, if you will. And so there will be a war that will be lost by the Armenians, will be won by Turkey, that will use Azerbaijan as a pawn to sort of essentially, as I mentioned, all events on Earth usually get influenced or they get started with the help of the spiritual beings from the other side. The other side being either the angels who typically are sent to protect human beings or the demons or the fallen angels who are meant to uh, essentially cause destruction. The demons are sent to start physical fights, verbal fights, wars, and so on and so forth. And so. The war in Nagorno-Karabakh is just an opening into the global conflict that will escalate in seven years after that war. In 2027, the World War III will actually start in that very region. So, mind you, the reason why the 2020 war will be very local and no nuclear weapons will be used but they will be used in 2027 is because in 2027 the political situation around the world will escalate to such a to such a degree that multiple countries will be involved in that very region where this very war will be restarted rekindled in Nagorno-Karabakh between Turkey and Iran between China yes yes China and Pakistan surprisingly and both Pakistan and China and Iran and the United States and Russia will actually use their nuclear weapons in the region of Nagorno-Karabakh which is right next to Noah's Ark the Ararat Valley which is the territory where it currently belongs to Ararat Mountain is the Turkish mountain used to belong to the Armenians and there will be this multiple debates over the territory who it belongs to. Long story short, in 2027, you definitely want to be in a bunker, not in the Caucasus, not anywhere near because it will be the most devastating war that the human race have ever seen. It's going to be catastrophic and this is why I'm here preparing you and, and I'm, I'm hoping that you would be essentially prepared and you would be praying and fasting in preparation for those events. So all those events would be not, not as damaging, uh, especially for the children, because it's bad enough for the adults. Now imagine uh, all the children that will be affected by the war in, in um, 2027. Yes, unfortunately, this is the end of human history as I saw it from the other side. So at that point in time, people will be literally being transported into heaven or paradise the same way I was transported when I was a little boy. 
so they would be taken up and just taken alive, I mean, just the same way I was taken alive to heaven. They would be taken alive to heaven, and those are the people who are what the Bible calls they walk with God. Using a modern language today, we use, remember, scientific vocabulary. People who, what I like to call, are on the frequency of God. People who are very close to God. They walk with God on a daily basis. They pray to God. They fast. Fasting is, by the way, not only is very good for your body, physical body, it actually cleanses your system and allows you to get tuned in into God's frequency much easier or faster, quicker. And I'm going to tell you all these uh, quote-unquote secrets and tricks how to get on the frequency of God quicker. So the first exercise I'd like to give you, besides going on that seven-day meditative state of retreat or with fasting that involves fasting, I would like to suggest to you that you go to a park unless you live somewhere in the country already, in the woods. And make sure that in that park you find a tree that you like, a big tree. Make sure there's no, no people around you because it, they will ridicule you and you would not be able to do this exercise correctly. You will not be able to reach the frequency of God. So what you do is you get to a place where there's nobody around and you put your hand on a tree, just eye level, and you focus, you meditate for about half an hour without talking audibly. You just focus. You thank the tree for being there, for producing oxygen. And let me tell you why, because on the other side, both trees and animals have their own language. I'm going to decipher it for you so that you'll understand what kind of language they have. Obviously, a tree cannot send you a letter or make a phone call to tell you all about it. It's, it's a different life form. And so it's more not as advanced as ours, similar to how we are not as advanced as the angelic life form, which is, as I mentioned, billions and billions of billions and billions of years ahead of our, our state of, you know, awareness. And so trees are just as alive as, as animals, and animals have their own language. So by placing your hand on a tree and by focusing and concentrating on God's creation and being in harmony with God's nature, with Mother Nature, and uh, by remembering that so many trees are being cut down for paper, for timber, for building housing, for just creating things that is just unbelievably wasteful its brutality in its uh, perfect form, meaning we're hurting our, our environment without even replacing it. And so that shows you our level of evolution. We're just like, we're actually, we are the murderers. We are the, um, we're not very advanced is my point. And so by focusing on that, and by asking for forgiveness of, from the tree, you know, you just have to sort of relate to the tree how its family essentially is being cut down at some other part of the world. It's not as lucky as where you are in the park. You will eventually be able to get on the frequency of, of the tree and kind of sort of understand, maybe not the first time, maybe the seventh time you're there in the park and you're doing the same routine. You'll be able to understand the language of that tree. And by doing so, you would essentially be able to eventually understand the language of animals. Stray animals, not your pets at home. If you have dogs and cats, that doesn't count. It's not the same. It's a little bit different. I'll, I'll tell you in a second. So you would go out and perhaps find a stray dog or a stray cat or a stray fox or a stray wolf, depending where you live. And then I'll tell you what they say to you when they see you, because it's a nonverbal communication. It's that, if you will, telepathic communication. But I assure you, they're sending you a message that I'm going to help you decipher it. So the tree is going to express to you its gratitude eventually once you get on that frequency. And then once you transition from the tree to the animal kingdom, you will be able to understand that those stray dogs or cats or foxes, if you run across any foxes where you live, you know, what they're trying to tell you is this. They would really love to be your friend and to be petted by you and just to experience uh, your company, but they're afraid that you're going to capture them, kill them, and turn them into a fur coat or something of that kind. You understand? Because that's what we've been doing to them over and over you know, since day one. And it's, it remains in their DNA memory, if you will, that because of our violent nature, they're afraid of us. They're afraid to come close to us, but they would love to because they're, they're on a different frequency. They don't mean no harm. 
In fact, there are plenty of documented cases where people who go out hunting in remote regions of anywhere remote in the mountains when they witness that a mountain lion sometimes would guard a wounded goat or sheep, not to eat it, but to guard it from other predators. Yes, yes, this is the most beautiful part of God's creation. You know, a mountain lion, when it sees that this completely helpless, wounded mountain goat or uh, some kind of animal that uh, injured itself needs protection against other predators, it actually defends that helpless animal. You understand that it's not that they're all going to eat each other. There is that honor system, even among animals. It's common knowledge. And so if you've never heard of it, perhaps you should uh, look into that. And my recommendation is that you spend more time in nature. If you live in the city, spend more time in, in a city park, or you go out in the woods, you go out into nature, you connect with nature, you put your hand on the tree, you just spend some time. Because we are not designed to live in this sort of a city environment, to be running in circles for a few dollars a month just to be able to survive, pay our rent, and pay our bills. It's just not, this is not what we're, why we come into this world. I assure you, God will provide using biblical language. If you believe in miracles, God will provide supernaturally. If you don't quite believe in uh, supernatural or miracles, then you will experience synchronicity, serendipities, that uh, a person that you need to see for your business transactions will appear in your life. Once you get to that stage of evolution, you see, spiritual evolution. Again, using a different language if you're not into the biblical terminology. But it's fine to me. I don't see any problems, biblical or scientific language. It's all the same. Bottom line, folks, is this. I will just tell you to summarize everything I wanted to say in this one phrase. Please listen carefully. We come here into this world from eternity past, from an eternal place. And we're here for about five minutes in the eyes of eternity. If you think about it, the eyes of eternity is just a few breaths that we take and then we return to that other place, you see? And so we're here, folks, for about five minutes. We come here from that other world that we immediately forget all about it. But you see, if you really think about it, we're here to do, we're here on a mission. We have a purpose, we have a destiny here on this planet, in this physical world. And as soon as our physical hearts will stop beating, which is again, just a few minutes in the eyes of eternity, we will depart from this world, we'll go back to that other place where we come from. And I'm here, having given this privilege to share with you to see what it's like on the other side, I'm here to tell you. I'm here to help you plan ahead that if you're already over 40, well, you only have a, but a few breaths left, honestly. You just have half a minute left on this planet. So having this knowledge, knowing the time schedule, hopefully you'll use your time more wisely. And I truly hope that you will be more inclined to more spiritual practices, to sharing kindness. We don't like, as men, we don't like to use the word love. Uh, usually women use a kind of language uh, with more ease. But, you know, if not love, let me define love from that other reality and scientifically for you. Love actually is the highest form of frequency, of vibration that God operates on. It's the highest frequency of God, that the brightest, the most luminous light, the most powerful energy in the universe that holds our universe together. That's right. In fact, the astrophysicists will discover that there is a force that exists that holds all physical objects in place. And all physical objects in outer space, in cosmos, represent what about 5% of the mass of the universe. The other 95% of the mass of the universe is this invisible force or energy that holds all things together. And our universe is actually constantly, it's moving and it's expanding our physical universe. I'm not talking about the hundreds of dimensions in the spiritual realm. That's a conversation for another time. But I'd like to encourage you, given the fact that we have established the fact that we're here for a very short time, 
I'd like to encourage you to focus more on sharing kindness, on learning kindness, sharing kindness. If you can't focus on love, at least share. Focus on kindness, share kindness. Help anybody who comes your way. If you see a homeless person on the street, just give them a few dollars. Don't judge him by saying, you know, he's a drug addict, he needs to go to a rehab, or perhaps he's a, just an actor who doesn't want to work. You know, really, that judgment actually would do a lot of damage to you and your life path, not to that homeless person. And also, you know, the Bible says that sometimes those homeless people are not homeless people. They're angels sent by God from heaven just to test your heart to see if you truly are that spiritual person that you claim to be or if this is a bunch of fluff, you know, that you're trying to impress other people around you. So when you don't help a homeless person on the street, you know what that tells about you. That means that you actually don't fully understand the reality. You know, again, the Bible says by entertaining strangers, sometimes we have unwittingly entertained angels. And we don't know when we're dealing, when we actually deal with angels or when we deal with the actual homeless people. So that's why I highly recommend that you just try to be kind. Give them a few dollars. If you don't have money, give them your energy, give them a hug, offer help, offer whatever help you can, whatever help you're able to give. The most important part that I'd like to uh, finish with, I'm looking for like-minded people. I'd like to form an army of believers, an army of spiritual warriors that would be just like me, who love God, who would like to be prepared for that exit from this physical world at the end of our time here, in by year 2027 or before then or whenever it's our time to go. And so I would like to say, let's unite. I will be actually building a team of like-minded people. We will host we will create a website where we could all meet and find each other and where we could start building those bunkers in preparation for those apocalyptic events. I will actually have, God willing, a global following because I believe this is my mission in life, to have this privilege to go to the other side, to receive all this information and this knowledge and to still remember it, to be given this gift, to retain this information by the time I, I came back to this planet. I believe that uh, this is my mission, is to unite as many believers worldwide as possible in the spirit of kindness and agape love, which is, by the way, the Greek word for the highest form of unconditional love of God that holds all things together. Agape love is the love that emanates from God, which is that highest form of uncreated light. That's what we are, folks. When you go to the other side, you begin to glow and kind of shine and because you're on that other frequency that is much, 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 much higher than we are here on Earth. Quite frankly, it was the saddest part to have to return to my parents on Earth because you would never, ever, 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 ever would want to come back from that beautiful place to this prison cell. Even if you're not in prison, this planet is a prison compared to paradise. I assure you of that because everything that we do here is absolutely contrary to what we should be uh, really striving for in terms of spirituality, our evolution, our development, and you know, sharing kindness. It's just not enough kindness in the world. I would also like to help our planet, Mother Earth, all the animals and rare plants to be replenished and to be more protected from us, the animals. The, I mean, the true barbarians or the murderers. So I would like to form a nonprofit organization and unite all like-minded people in a very uh, coherent, organized fashion to protect Mother Nature, the animals, the environment, our planet. So many whales are dying because of the sonars that the submarines use on them in the open ocean and that actually kills them, that kills the, the guiding system of the whales and they're left kind of blinded, if you will. They're left uh, without their most important organ that gives them, that allows them to uh, navigate in the oceans. It's a sad situation. All the trees that are being cut down. Folks, what can I say? When you see all these events happening, the 2020 biological warfare that will lead to the mark of the beast, the distribution and acceptance by many people who will be so blinded. When you see Joan Rivers disappearing, we're dying suddenly, 
in September of 2014 when she would want to actually go public with this information that the first family in the White House is a, a very unusual family with her sexual orientation, you know, the first transvestite in the White House. And when you see the war in 2020 in the Caucasus, in Nagorno-Karabakh region, you know that the end is near. And then when you see, by the way, all these events could change every single one of them if all people would get on their knees and pray face down in the ground or on the floor, being in that prostrate state of full prostration and full commitment to change, which it could happen, but it will probably not happen because people, unfortunately, are not that level. Of, they're not that spiritual. They're just like in the days of Noah, as Jesus said, you know, they'll be marrying and giving in marriage uh, right before the flood came and took them all away. And the same, same, same identical situation I'm here sharing with you with the knowledge from the other side of all of these events that will be taking place. You could share with the world, but the world will actually be wiped out in 2027 in this nuclear catastrophic war that will happen in 2027. But if all the people of the earth will get on their face and pray about this or that event, actually we have the power to, with God's, this is how God ordained this universe, we have the power to change these events, to change the course of history of the human race. And so this nuclear war could be postponed or essentially canceled. This uh, biological warfare in 2020 could be postponed or canceled if all the believers would get on their knees and faces and pray to God in that prostrate fashion. By the way, prostration is very common in Buddhism. For example, if you go to any of the Buddhist temples, most people do their prostrations as a norm, as a form of uh, reverence and respect. But in the West, unfortunately, or similar to, for example, Muslim believers, they do their prostrations in their mosques around the world facing Mecca. But all the Christians, unfortunately, are so, have become so lackadaisical about their approach and commitment to prayer that it's just really, truly a shame how it's very unfortunate how they try to get some kind of, uh, I don't know, delivery help package from God in between their meals at the fast food restaurant at McDonald's, between eating a fat burger, how they're sort of expecting God to respond to their prayers while they're eating that. I mean, it's just, uh, it never ceases to amaze me how Christians are uh, so, I mean, they're on the wrong path. Whereas our Muslim brothers and Buddhist brothers, you know, they're praying, praying. Really, they're showing their tremendous faith. For example, when you go to the second tallest mountain in the world, Mount Kailash, which, by the way, for some strange reason, nobody knows about in the United States of America or in the West, for that matter. It's the mountain, the only mountain that is uh, shaped like a pyramid that was built by a very advanced civilization. And that is the, the reason why Hitler sent an expedition to that region to try to find those secrets from that advanced civilization in 1930s, early 30s. And the uh, name of that organization was Das Anunerbi, or Our Heritage, translated into English. And so it was a very well-funded organization with the best scientists and archaeologists. And they did receive uh, tremendous knowledge from, from those expeditions. But the point is, Mount Kailash is so holy for the locals that they don't allow anybody to climb it. Anybody who you know, defies the order and tries to climb Mount Kailash will be immediately hanged. And so everybody seems to respect that rule. But the tallest mountain in the world Mount Jamalungma, which is 29,000 feet, you know, people die there all the time. They Meaning it's allowed, but they climb it disrespectfully. They climb it and they often, they show the colors, you know, all the mountain climbers, sometimes they, they bitterly argue amongst themselves. And you can actually, if you talk to them, you realize as soon as the, the fight starts, the verbal fight starts, usually, see, in the mountains, you're not protected by anything. And when you're sitting in your comfy chair drinking your coffee or tea, if you want to say something ugly to your family member, or your friend, or somebody about someone you see on TV, well, there's seemingly no repercussion, you, you might think, right? You said something, and you're still sitting in your comfy chair drinking your tea or coffee. But in the mountains, you many, many, many times, as soon as somebody says something negative about their team member or somebody else, they usually lose balance and they fall off the cliff into the ravine or they disappear. 
and mountains so treacherous because of the every mountain climb in this experience they come with reverence when they attempt to climb a mountain such as K2 or Jamalungman. Yes, Karakaru Mountains in northern Pakistan are the most dangerous mountains in the world, more dangerous than Jamalungma. But anyway, I'm digressing slightly. I'd like to say that there are, the point of bringing up the mountains is, there are consequences in this physical world. Even with your words that you sometimes uh, use in a very imprudent way, when you call somebody names, whether they deserve it or not, it actually is going to come back and bite you in the neck. Or as Jesus puts it, he who lives by the sword shall also die by the sword. And if you do a study of famous people, because that's the only study you could do that will actually allow you to track them down and see how they died. If you actually look into the, I'll give you just one example and we're going to move on to another much more important topic here. Jesse James, who used to kill people for for a living and uh, he was killed by someone who was actually holding the same gun who was killed by another person who was holding the same gun it's amazing and then on and on and on and on it's like a cycle of violence you know so and so killed so and so and so and so killed in turn so and so and it goes on all the way to to today and in the here and now it happens in the very same way so no wonder jesus said he who lives by the sword shall also die by the sword so I'd like to conclude with all the events I had mentioned and all everything that I've learned on the other side where the language is higher mathematics. God operates in a very unique way and from that eternal perspective the only thing that we could relate to is kindness and agape love or the highest form of vibration or desire to help another human being. I would like to invite everyone who agrees with this message, who is called to hear this message. That's right, if you hear this message, if you're hearing it right now, that means it was meant to be. Your name was written in the Book of Life, and you are called to follow this mission, this movement that I'm organizing. I just want to invite you to join our organization, our movement, our nonprofit, and uh, just let us know how you could help our movement. What skill sets you have. If you have a lot of time, just uh, let us know. If you have a lot of ideas how to build bunkers or how we could create a new type of technology and uh, new type of propulsion engines and uh, build uh, livable space on, on the moon or on Mars, let us know. I have no limitations, so I believe that we can actually do that. We can actually escape the 2027 catastrophic events unless we'll be simply picked up by the angels of God, you know, in the event prior to World War III. But be it as it may, just let us know. Reach out to us. If you're a visionary, if you have ideas, if you're a philanthropist, you could actually help fund certain projects or if you're an engineer, you know actually how to build the bunkers. Whatever your talent it is, just let us know. And uh, we need everyone with their wonderful God-given talents to actually act as one unit, as one organization, as one living organism of God. And only then we could survive. So I can only bring my humble experience that I shared with you today, and I decided to, to do that because I simply had no other choice. The technology now, as I mentioned, is here. Finally, you can buy a relatively inexpensive camcorder and record it. And uh, I also am recording it on a, a separate audio device, just in case if something goes wrong with the internal camcorder's uh, microphone, so that way my voice could be heard. But on and on, I just decided to uh, bring up Tony Evans and his wonderful message. And of course, who knows what kind of technology we will have in 2027. Perhaps uh, this type of message may not be what will be commonplace. Perhaps we'll be using much more advanced technology that would allow us to gain immediate instant access to, to this message and instantly have a hologram projected in front of us or perhaps in our, inside our brain. My trip to the other side actually ended right before the year 2027. As the war was getting started, there was no further information that was given to me or I was allowed to see how events would progress from there. 
all I know is that the war will happen. It will be nuclear and multiple nations will be involved. And those select few souls would be few souls. Yes, not uh, it will not be a mass exodus to heaven. It will be select few souls will be taken alive to heaven. But for those of us who will uh, remain on earth at that time when we're still alive, you know, we would have to survive. And that's the purpose of this message is to unite us all, the best of the best, like-minded people who will be sharing kindness and a common vision of worshiping God, survival, and building a new kind of society on earth or perhaps on the moon or on Mars with new kind of uh, understanding and awareness, new kind of technology that uh, perhaps I have faith we, we might possess and uh, we'll be able to travel instantly. I do not mean the rockets. I do not mean the rockets. Please don't misunderstand me. That's not the type of technology that I know. In fact, I'm working right now on a few ideas how to implement everything that I've learned on the other side to have the first device that will uh, defy the laws of physics here on Earth. And as soon as I have it operational, I will share it in another message similar to this one. On this note, I'd like to wish you all the best. I would like to encourage you to reach out to us. Let us know how you could help us. Let us know where you are. Let us know briefly about your history, where you come from, how big is your family, and uh, what your special traits are, special skills, how old you are, and uh, preferably, hopefully, you'll speak English if you're going to be uh, contacting us from outside of the United States. I want to wish you all the best. I want to wish you to find the path, the frequency of God, to remain on this path until the day that you depart from this world. Because we're only here for only five minutes. And if you're over 40 and listening to this message, you only have but a few breaths left. On this note, may God richly bless you, keep you safe and away from all evil by sending his angels to guard you and protect you everywhere you go. God bless you, take care. And I hope to see you on the other side in paradise of God.